Um, we are reconvening the meeting from executive session and we are now on item four of our agenda. Um, I wanted to give a brief update on the Safe Schools Working Group to let everyone know where we are with that. Um, first, I just want to start off by saying that culture and climate is something that this district has, uh, you know, really looked at strategically, especially this past year. And it was one of our goals that our district creates safe, student-centered, innovative learning environments. When we look at our safety system, we understand that we need to take a holistic approach. It's about ensuring the safety of our buildings physically, for our students and staff and community, but also the emotional and mental safety of everyone in our buildings. And that's really what this working group and this process will go through. We also want to tie this directly to our strategic planning efforts because that we know that having a safe learning environment is a foundation um, for education. We know that students who don't feel safe cannot learn. Um, we want to make sure that it is tied in with all of our work. So today I will be announcing that we are creating the safety, uh, the safe schools working group and process. Um, because of the overwhelming support of you, the CCS community, we had over, we had 237 people reach out and say that, that you wanna be part of this, which is amazing. Um, you are parents and, and teachers, you are community members, you are police officers, you are um, you know, members of our team, members of our community, and we appreciate it. We asked uh, those members or those individuals who are interested to complete a, a little survey so that we could get a little more information about you. 179 people completed that survey. 179 people. And so that survey was completed by Friday and the board has been going through names. And because we know it is critical to get the right people around the table, we are not going to announce the members tonight. But we are going to announce because we had 237 people and many more who emailed, many more who reached out, many more who comment on Facebook. Um, we want to announce some opportunities to create more engagement, to create the community value around the safety system of our schools. As we move into strategic planning, you've heard, you maybe you watched some of, some of those messages and some of those sessions from the board. We're in the process of creating what these values are. And so we want to really fully engage in that. And so we will take some time to have some community sessions. And if anyone participated in the portrait of a graduate, that is what we are looking at, the ability for us to engage and to really share. Um, once we complete those, those sessions, we will, then have the working group begin their work um, and really focus in and hone in on recommendations that will help us strategically have the best safety structure uh, that we can. Our goal is to be a model of urban education to push forward in a 21st century um, education uh, model. And we know that safety is a foundation of that. Um, the timelines. So this is not an excuse to stop timelines. This is important work. And in fact, we are going to very much align it to this aggressive strategic planning work that the board and superintendent are working on right now. The committee of the working group um, will be convened and have until November um, 17th, the board meeting on November 17th to bring back recommendations. And this is because we really do want to consider that in the strategic planning process, which will begin, um, which the board will have its recommendations on in Dece on December 1st. If you heard us in our last meeting, that was our goal so that the superintendent could then begin her work on developing the methods and strategies about how to actually uh, uh, offer those goals. So we are really taking the approach that is meaningful. We want true engagement. We want this to have impact. We wanna make sure all voices are heard around the table. 
I will tell you right now, uh, one reason that we cannot convene this committee uh, at the moment is because I have one student. Student voices are essential to this. So we will work on a way to figure out how to better engage our students and ensure that they are part of this process. Um, so we will have more information. Uh, we will put out what we have right now as a framework. I also want to announce that we have some staff members who will be working on this effort. Um, again, because it is about the safety system, we're gonna have um, Cheryl Ward, uh, who works a lot on social emotional learning and, and has a, a whole host of wonderful experience there. Chris Ward, who is head of our safety and security team, and James Barnes, who is our chief legal counsel um, and has, has a passion for this as well as done some research already. Um, I, I cannot tell you how proud I am of the types of people who have said that they want to help. You are coming from everywhere. You are coming from, um, you know, Ed education, you are coming from the public defender's office, you are coming from our partners. I mean, we are going, we are going to come up with some amazing recommendations um, about how we can do this collectively and do it in the best way possible. So that is where we are at the moment. I have given you timelines. So this work will be done by November 17th. I have told you that we will have um, an additional engagement process because we feel that that is the right thing to do to hear more from you. And I told you that we will convene this safe um, schools working group um, whose work will be complete in November. So that is where we are. I wanna thank every person who applied, every person who is considering helping us. And if you didn't apply and you wanna share, feel free. Um, and again, we'll have more ways to engage you. So that's where we are right now um, with that, okay? All right, um, so now I will turn it over to, actually number five, public comment. We do not have any public comment this evening. So we will go ahead and move into item six, the executive report uh, from the superintendent. And as she is getting ready, I think a lot of you who are waiting and watching, this is the moment in this meeting you've actually been waiting for. Um, and I just wanna preface by saying that this is an exciting time for us. It is going to be challenging, um, but we really have the opportunity to embrace what we're gonna hear as a community and really consider how we begin to continue to push ourselves um, to, have that 21st century model of education. Um, and so, you know, I think that if we come at this with the right attitude, it's not only gonna help our students, um, but it will help us move forward faster in our strategic goals. I'm proud of our team for all the work that they've done on this. I wanna say that up front, and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Madam Superintendent. Thank you, President Adair. Uh, this evening, my cabinet and I will um, be presenting to the board and to the entire CCS community our initial reopening plan for a safe start to school this fall. Tonight's presentation is unlike any other presentation. Yes, it will include facts. Yes, it is based on research and best practices and expert advice and counsel, both internal and external. And it includes graphs and illustrations. But this presentation is different. Like all school districts in Ohio and across the country, we have found ourselves in uncharted territory. We face perhaps what would be one of the most difficult challenges in our district's history. In just two months, as we do every fall, we will once again begin our mission of educating 50,000 of our city's most precious beings. We work tirelessly to help shape their lives and their futures. This year, of course, our efforts will be intensified as we work to project, to protect rather, their health and safety from the spread 
of the COVID-19 virus. It is important that we say that out loud. We cannot become complacent in our safety first priority as it relates to the global pandemic. However, it is equally important to say that I am confident that we have harnessed the expertise of our staff and teachers, health officials and community partners to develop the best strategies for a safe start to school. Although we face great challenges in delivering a safe start, we will also see great opportunities. Therefore, tonight you will hear recommendations and strategies to reopen, re-engage and reimagine a safe start in the fall of 2020. Before I call on um, members of my cabinet to present the details of our initial plan, I would like to ask that the board and all of our CCS stakeholders keep the following in mind. The recommendations are based on the intensive work of the reopening task force I appointed in May. Their work does not end today. The task force has examined every possible scenario for starting the new school year safely, operationally, and academically under the COVID-19 guidelines and recommendations. The task force was comprised of nine working groups led by cabinet members who oversee departments covering transportation and operations, to curriculum and virtual learning, to budget and finance, to engagement. More than 150 staff, faculty, union leaders, district partners, and community and business leaders have been meeting, planning, researching, really working around the clock to recommend strategies for a safe start to school. We also surveyed all district stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, staff, to ensure we considered their input and opinions in our planning. We asked questions such as, did they feel safe returning to the classroom? How did they feel about online learning? Did they depend on Columbus City Schools for their transportation needs? and ask their opinion about wearing mask or not wearing mask. In this era of uncertainty, there are two things I am certain of. The plan presented this evening will change and not everyone will be happy with every aspect of the plan. For example, some of our families believe their child must wear a mask to return to school safely. Some do not want their students to wear masks. Some believe remote online learning is the only safe back to school plan, while others want to return to in-person classes as usual. Others are comfortable with the combination of both. The almost daily COVID-19 updates and changing guidance from our health officials necessitate operational flexibility. Families should anticipate changes to this initial reopening plan based on a number of factors, including changing health and safety guidelines from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention and the Ohio Department of Health. Updated guidance from the Ohio Department of Education, Governor DeWine, Governor DeWine or the legislature, and agreements with the district labor union partners. This transportation remains one of the largest challenges to our reopening plans. On a typical day, CCS provides transportation for more than 40,000 students to and from 110 district school sites 
as well as 150 charter and non-public schools. We're still awaiting final guidelines from ODE for transporting students to and from school. Our team will review this information when it's available to update our transportation plan that will require social distancing and wearing masks while on the bus. District families, students and staff can expect to receive more information this summer as it becomes available. We know our families will like to receive final plans now. COVID-19 simply does not allow it. As we reopen, re-engage and reimagine, our plans provide choice and options for our families in a manner that balances the need to provide meaningful instruction to students with the need to protect their health and safety, as well as that of our teachers, staff, and community. The initial reopening plan has many components, but perhaps an easy way to think about it is in two broad categories. One, health and safety, and two, teaching and learning. The health and safety of our students, staff, and the Columbus community is our top priority as we plan for how to reopen schools and office building. Every CCS building will have hygiene and social distancing protocols that must be followed. The recommendations you will hear in more detail will include all staff will be required to wear masks. All students will be required to wear a mask and wear a mask on the bus. Efforts are underway to implement social distancing in the classrooms and in common areas, including staying at least six feet away from others whenever possible. Families will be asked to do, do home assessments at their, of their students' health each day before sending them to school. And staff will be asked to do self-assessments of their own health before reporting to work each day. These are just a few of the health and safety protocols that will be implemented. Our teaching and learning plan includes, uh, provides choice and options for our families. Here's what we'll review tonight regarding teaching and learning formats. High school students will attend school remotely full time from home for at least the first two quarters of the school year. You'll hear tonight that our high school students can choose between two online formats one that offers instruction by CC, CCS teachers, and the other one, and the other, a self-paced curriculum through our new CCS Digital Academy. Students in kindergarten through eighth grade will attend school using a blended learning model that combines two days per week of in-person instruction at school with three days of online instruction at home. Additional planning for specific student populations will also be provided, such as students with special needs, our English language learners, career and technical education, and others. Columbus City Schools K-8 families who may not want to send their students to school in person can choose to have their students attend an all virtual CC, CCS Digital Academy. This completely remote learning option goes above and beyond the virtual learning curriculum that CCS students and families experienced while they were closed this past spring. You'll hear more details about this exciting new plan during the presentation. To be successful without a Without any doubt, all of us, students, parents, teachers, staff, and partners must work together and collaborate with the dual focus of safety and learning. 
So I'd like um, to now ask our Chief of Transformation and Leadership, Dr. Angela Chapman, to begin telling you more about the work and the recommendation of the reopening task force. Dr. Chapman. Good evening. Throughout the process of planning for reopening, we aim to keep the students at the center of our work. We heard from our stakeholders, various stakeholders, parents, guardians, students, teachers, uh, community leaders, and we also needed to make sure that we balance the needs of our technology, as well as the medical advice of our health providers. Our core values throughout um, this planning process served as an anchor for us. We made sure that we prioritize the health and safety of all of our students and staff when making these recommendations. Um, we aim to maintain an inclusive, caring, and supportive school culture for all of our learners. We also are aiming to work on developing systematic protocols to ensure the health and safety of all of our students and well as staff. In addition, we are making sure that we consider timely communication, what that looks like for all stakeholder groups as well as transparency. We want everyone to feel as if they have all of the information that they need to make informed decisions as it relates to reopening in the fall. To anchor this work, we made references to several model guidelines. Um, throughout the planning of the, the nine different work groups, we referred to the health and safety guidelines from the Ohio Department of Health and CDC. We reviewed multiple reopening plans from school districts around the country. Those were individual school district plans as well as state plans. We also participated in numerous webinars and conversations with our colleagues and peers um, across the country it is a part of professional organizations such as the Ohio School Boards Association and the Council of Great City Schools. We also were invited to um, work with the Ohio State University, the College of Education and Human Ecology to provide us with feedback on our plan as well as our recommendations that we are presenting tonight. The timeline to reopening uh, began back in the spring um, we began to um, access the needs of our stakeholders and community members. We established the working group task force. There were nine separate work groups that Dr. Dixon mentioned. We began conducting our research, reviewing the guidance, reviewing um, the model plans from other states, and then drafting our guiding documents. Um, this evening, you'll hear more about our proposed plan for reopening in the fall, and it's noted here on the timeline that the plans that we are presenting have to be flexible, they have to be nimble, because as you know, the more information that we receive about COVID-19 and the pandemic, we may need to make adjustments. We are still waiting further guidance from our local officials, from the governor and Ohio Department of Education, which we anticipate we will be receiving more information later this week. So um, this, the plans that we are presenting, again, are flexible. We will be nimble and we will make adjustments along the way based on the latest information that we receive at the time. And now I would like to pass um, this to Dr. Michelle Klein, our Chief of Data and Accountability. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Over the last four months, many surveys have been completed by a variety of our stakeholders. Surveys completed have been to classified non-school and school-based staff, teachers, central office administrators, non-school-based administrators, instructional assistants, parents and guardians, as well as our substitute pool. A complete list of all results and graphs of all surveys are now available on our CCS website for your review and our community review as well. I will be highlighting some of the top results of the student and parent surveys during this presentation. We had 4,032 student responses. While that number may seem small, please remember that this survey was sent out via student email accounts, which students just received the last day of March 
and which students do not traditionally use during the summer months. We did receive 10,839 parent and guardian surveys. There were 8,704 identifiable unique responses, which represent at least one response from 7,066 of our 29,544 unique households. This is 23.92% of household representation from just the targeted survey, not inclusive of any of the anonymous responses. You might say, well, what were the anonymous responses? Those came from our CCS website, Facebook, Twitter, and families enrolled for next school year, but who do not currently have an active student enrolled that can be traced back to a household. From this student perspective, this represents 27.5% of students not including any student who would be represented as part of the 2,135 anonymous respondents. According to Question Pro, online survey response rates vary, but appear to average between 20 and 30%, while offline and field surveys have a response rate of about 22%. So at 27.5%, our response rate was right in the ballpark with our parent guardian back to school survey. On the next slide, you can see the pie chart on the left. 79% of our parents and guardians that responded to the survey said that they have a personal computer, tablet, or Chromebook in their household to allow their child or children to participate in online learning. The pie chart on the right displays how many of our parents and guardians that responded currently have internet access. According to the parent guardian results, 94% of our parents indicate that they have internet access. According to the students who responded to the survey, student survey, 95.7 of our students indicated that they have internet access. Very similar results from both the parent guardian survey and the student survey. As far as different delivery models of instruction, our parents who responded clearly wished for an in-person, face-to-face, or blended learning model, both receiving 38% each, with an online virtual represented by 24% of our parents. In the event that modifications need to be made to safely open, 26% of our parents who responded preferred virtual. 27% preferring alternative weeks of instruction, and the largest majority of parents responding to the survey voted 47% for alternative days of instruction. The graph on the right shows that of parents and guardians responding, 31% of them may be interested in a CCS Digital Academy for the 2020-21 school year. As far as different delivery models of instruction, when reviewing the responses of those students who responded, 42.3% of our students requested face-to-face -face delivery of instruction with 35.7% for blended instruction, meaning both virtual and face-to-face, -face, and 22.1% completely virtual. We plan to offer a full continuum of services for the 2020 2021 school year, including as much face-to-face -face instruction as possible with the current health pandemic guidance, to a blended brick and click delivery with in-person days and remote days, and then finally to a completely 100% CCS digital academy for students in grades K through 12 for parents who do not wish to send their students to an in-person school at all for the 2020-2021 school year. With regard to transportation in the pie chart on the left, parents and guardians who responded indicated that 58% of our parents would use the yellow bus transportation system, while 42% said they would not use the yellow bus system. Moving over to the right pie chart, you can see that of the parents guardians that responded, they overwhelmingly agree that they will send their students to school if a face mask is required, with 70% agreeing. And finally, students who were asked to respond to the following statement, I will come to school if I have to wear a mask. Of the students who responded to the student survey, their results were very similar to that of the parent guardian survey with 71.3% of the students saying that they would wear masks to school. At this time, 
I will turn the presentation back over to Dr. Angela Chapman, our Chief of Transformation and Leadership, who will describe in detail our fluid, nimble academic plan. Angela? Thank you. So as we look at our plans for reopening, again, we want to reassure everyone that we prioritize the health and safety of our students, staff, and community. We had to consider the instructional implications, the resources available, financial as well as human, and as well as the feasibility of the plan scenarios. Certainly there are several variables and moving targets that we have to continue to keep in mind. Additional further guidance from government and health officials. As I mentioned earlier, we are awaiting additional guidance from the governor, which should be coming this week. We are awaiting additional guidance regarding transportation regulations related to social distancing on the bus. Certainly the number of students needing transportation is a huge factor for us considering the size of our student population and the number of students that we transport to and from school daily. And the number of students or families opting to attend the virtual academy. Our recommendations are that we consider two days of in-person learning at school for our students in grades pre-K through eight. So group A would be at school on Monday and Tuesday and learning from home on Wednesday through Friday. Group B, which is the other half of the cohort for grades pre-K through eight, would be at home learning from home Monday through Wednesday, and then they would transition to school on Thursday and Friday for in-person instruction. That would be three days of remote learning at home for all of our students in grades pre-K through eight and two days of in-person learning at school. Our pre-K through eight families would also have the option to choose the 100% online only format, which is our virtual academy, which we will discuss in further detail shortly. For our students in grades nine through 12, we are recommending that our students remain at home, learning at home, full-time remote learning, at least for the first two quarters or the first semester of the school year. Our families of our high school students also have the option to choose between the virtual learning academy or the blended learning option, which we will discuss, discuss in further detail shortly. This is a sample schedule for our pre-K through eight students and families. This is a sample schedule for a, the week. So group A, again, learning at school the first two days of the week, and then learning from home the, for the remainder of the week. Group B would be learning at home for the first three days of the week, and then learning at school for the remainder of the week. Again, this calendar is just a sample that shows two days of in-person instruction or uh, brick days and three days of learning from home, which we also have called our click days. These two calendars represent um, another way of looking at the two days of in-person instruction and the three days of learning at home, particularly for our pre-K through eight families. So these are still draft calendars, but if you look at the, the, the dates that are highlighted in blue, that would be the first group, group A. These represent the two days that they would be learning um, in school. And then group B is represented in the dark gold color. Those, that, those dates represent the two days that, that that group would be learning in school. The second calendar represents the proposed calendar for Woodcrest Elementary, which is our one year round school. We are recommending that Woodcrest will remain 100% online for the first month of school and then transition to the blended learning model, which we described previously on September 8th, when the remainder of the students in the district in grades pre-K through eight transition to blended learning. And now I'm going to invite Dr. Tracy Ocasio, our Chief Academic Officer, to discuss the various options related to the blended learning formats. 
Good evening. So I'm here to share with you some of the formats that we looked at and considered and also are considering to offer our students. So parents have options. One of the things that we need to understand are the words synchronous and asynchronous. This is important to know when you're considering these formats. So just like, and this is the English teacher in me, just like the words might suggest anything that's synchronous, it's in sync. It's happening at the same time. So the group is learning and has a learning experience at a designated time. Something that's asynchronous is just like the word atypical. It's not happening at the same time. It's happening at the pace of the student. Some students may be learning and some may not at that time. It allows some flexibility around the timing. So one of the things that you may have noticed in our current plan for the spring, there was a combination of, of these things. There was some asynchronous, there were some synchronous events that occurred. You'll see similar here. These three educational settings are being offered next year for families to select and all students at every grade level have two possible options. So we're looking at the first option. The first column here on the left is the blended learning grades pre-K to eight. And as you can see, we've decided that in this particular option, we have new resources. We've just previously adopted new resources, K to 12 in English language arts and math. Those resources have both digital and print resources. So there is a, a series of print resources that are in a typical, more traditional classroom, but there's also then a digital component. That digital component is meant to support the instruction of the teacher. And so in this blended format, we would have students engage in the classroom, which would have smaller te teacher ratios based on the recommendations of the CDC. They'd be using these new curriculum resources on the days that they're present, which would be twice a week for this physical, more traditional setting in this learning experience. And so on the other three days, they would work in a remote setting. That means they would work from home, grandparents' home, or wherever that might be, but not on the school grounds with the teacher. It would be in this remote setting. They would, in that setting, have opportunities to complete assignments that would either extend their learning or that would also go over key points of learning that they had covered with the teacher. They would complete that prior to arriving again at the school setting for their next set of in-person setting um, experiences. What you'll notice in this particular setting, if it's a blended learning setting with a pre-K through eight student, the assignments that happen in a more traditional face-to-face -face classroom environment may also integrate technology. That is our hope, that teachers would use those resources in the classroom, which helps students become more accustomed to using them when they're in the remote setting. This also allows them to use a combination of both digital and print resources in the actual traditional classroom setting. Students would complete assignments prior to arriving or they would complete assignments after leaving that traditional format. They would be offered opportunities to extend their learning during that remote work at home. In addition to the more traditional take-home assignments, we do have uh, regular consumables that students would have that are their own book that they would not share with another person, um, especially for those ELA resources, those English language arts resources. They might have some of those to complete at home where they would not need to access a computer in order to do that. They may also have a combination. It may require some computer work. It may require some um, in seat with more traditional types of resources. And our new programs allow for that. They also will, and this is during their um, asynchronous time, the time that they're not meeting together with other students, they would also have some online platform work. The teacher could assign things from their online platform that's associated with the new core curriculum. We have supplemental resources as well. So during those remote days, students have the opportunity to work at their own pace with some of our supplemental resources. For example, a student in K-8 to has access to iReady, similar to what they use this year. The one thing that is necessary to know about this is that the primary mode for learning in this first column, in this first setting, the blended learning setting, is that students are working synchronous with a teacher. They participate in class, they participate in direct instruction, and it's a very essential part of their learning. That's how they're covering their content. The asynchronous part, the part that they do on their own, at their own time frame, at their own pace, happens at home, but it's meant to augment learning. And there are other experiences that may happen during that day. So core instruction happens in person at, 
face to face, but we've also looked at other types of subjects that could be taught in the remote setting to give students a touch point with an adult in case they're experiencing difficulty, whether it's in that adult content area or it's some other um, troubleshooting that the adult can do for that student. So during their remote time, they may have experiences where there's direct instruction provided, let's say, for example, a phys ed teacher, and that may occur during their remote learning experience. They may have um, groups provided by a social worker during that remote experience as well. So when we look at this next piece, I'm gonna ask you to consider the column on the other side, the far other side, that would be the right, where it says remote high school learning, grades nine to 12. Very similar in many ways and also dissimilar, and we'll go through that right now. Remote learning at the high school level will also involve students receiving their instruction using those digital and print resources that were recently adopted by the district. They'll also receive instruction that comes directly from the teacher using some form of technology. And in this case, it would be a form of a technology platform that's meant to engage students. So it might be something like a Google Classroom or something in the new Canvas platform that teachers offer direct instruction, they create lessons, they prepare those lessons, they implement those lessons online in a remote space. Students then also may engage in more independent work during that time frame. They may work on projects, they may work on assignments that complement what the teacher has shared with them in terms of their instruction when it was led by the teacher you would see that there's going to also be, in this case, a mix of synchronous and asynchronous learning. There may be times that a, te a teacher may assign something where their setting may be asynchronous. The, the student may work on their own at their own pace. It may be using the platforms associated to these digital and print resources that we've adopted. It may be using supplemental platforms that we've used this year as well. The other piece of this is that Students are assigned to classes where the teacher may lead that class online for a portion of that time, and the rest of that learning experience could be involved group activities, or it could be some type of remote experience that involves independent learning. That would be dependent upon the teacher's coverage and the way they set up, design their lessons to cover that content. Their schedule may also look like a typical high school schedule. So I have a period one, I get assigned a link to enter that period one classroom. My teacher shares information, they provide direct instruction. They um, offer me assignments that would extend my thinking or opportunity to practice. And then the student would go to their next period class. So it would look very similar to a traditional high school. However, the student would be learning from home. There would be remote experiences. That's synchronous learning as well. And so if a student is interested in working with the rest of their peers at the same time, that would be a better suit, suited experience for them. And so their schedule, as I mentioned, may look like that high school schedule. It would have links to assigned classes. They would be expected to log in at specific times, that synchronous, synchronous learning experience. Now there's that middle option. This is a little bit more flexible and it's a little bit, it's a little differently designed. However, it is meant to cover the same types of content because Ohio um, Department of Education requires us to offer experiences where students master and demonstrate mastery of standards. So this content would be aligned to standards as well. This experience, a student, any student, K to 12 has the option of enrolling in our CCS Digital Academy. This will look differently though, however, than what they experienced in the spring. And we've learned some lessons. Our spring um, setting required us to act quickly with existing resources. So what we've done is we've considered that format and looked at what worked and also what may it not have worked as well. This specific experience is designed to be self-paced. We have a self-paced online platform designed just for that to offer this continuum of learning experiences where students will engage in asynchronous learning. So it may be that high schooler that likes to learn late at night, that would be okay. They could work with their content at a time that works best for them. It may be that younger student that mom needs to work with them on some of their content and that may be later in the evening. So this is all asynchronous. It works for when it works for the family and the student. And so they are responsible for participating in this self-paced learning. The students also would receive teachers supplemental lessons that would focus on providing direct instruction that may provide intervention when a student struggles or enrichment for advanced students. It may be something the teacher pushes out to them or it may be a prescribed time that the teacher says, here's when I'm doing this lesson, I need you to log on at this time. 
The teacher may assign it to all students in that grade level or in that class roster, or may assign it to specific students. It would be dependent on what the teacher is seeing with student needs. The other piece of that is, this isn't only just for intervention. Teachers may assign, they may augment this self-paced platform with additional instruction. And for example, if a teacher is teaching experimental and theoretical probability, they may anticipate difficulties that students may have. So they'll create a lesson that will address that in anticipation of mislearning. And so a teacher may offer that to all students. A teacher may also offer a lesson that connects to prior learning standards. So if a teacher is, or if a student is having difficulty with a particular set of standards, the teacher may observe you know, the errors that the student is making and then may offer learning experiences again at a time that all students log in or may push that out for students to work um, on additional self-paced learning. The other part of this is if I'm the teacher and I'm thinking about a lesson that involves content where I want to assure, assure the students learn it more deeply, and I know that this content is very important for mastery for the next grade experience or the next content experience in that grade level, I may design a lesson to help students work more deeply on that content. Another example would be if I'm teaching students to attack a problem with two unknown variables in math. I may decide that I want to provide instruction that facilitates the students making connections between the typical ways of doing that, that we were presenting in class on the self-paced. And so that may be my designing a lesson that gets them to consider the connections between graphing linear equations using the substitution method versus using the elimination method. And I want to make sure that my students really understand how these things connect and how they differ and also to examine their own reasoning around using that methodology. That may be another type of lesson that you would see from a teacher in the digital academy for one of those high school math classrooms. So as we think about this, all K-12, to and this is just the reminder, all K-12 to students have the option of, a, of electing to do the CCS digital academy that allows more flexibility for the time frame for learning. Much of this learning is dependent on those more asynchronous lessons. And so as we move to the next slide, there's a graph here that kind of shows the differences and the connections between these things. And so when you look at this Venn diagram, you'll notice down the center, when we look at both of these options, whether it's the CCS Digital Academy or it's some blended learning form in these cohort models for K to eight, there is some variance, but there's also some similar connection. In some ways, students do have control over time and place. We know though in the blended setting or even in the high school remote setting, there are things that are assigned at a very particular time, that, that synchronous learning, everybody is logged on. In some cases, there may be asynchronous opportunities, times that students may complete assignments in the remote setting where they're not uh, designed or anchored to a particular time. There's also a fundamental shift in the instructional delivery and our professional development model um, that we are putting forward accounts for this. It accounts for more traditional integration or more technical integration in the traditional setting. So for the times that students are face-to-face, -face, we'll see more integration of technology. Our professional development also talks about ways to engage students when they're in these remote settings or ways to monitor and help students progress in this digital academy when the majority of their learning is in this more asynchronous time. So one of the other things that you're going to notice is that much of our professional development will focus in on engaging students with these digital tools, regardless of setting. And that's an area where they all have similarities. In terms of credit recovery and AP classes, we can offer this regardless of setting as well. So if a student is in a class in a 10th grade and they have some credit recovery they need to um, obtain or perform or engage in, we can offer that even if they decide to pick the remote option where they're assigned to classes that occur at particular times. We can also offer that whether they're assigned, even if they're assigned to that digital academy. You'll also notice that a lot of this requires flexibility. That's unusual for education. We do tend to have our boxes, but in, as we move forward in these spaces, they're new. And so our teachers will need some grace. Our students will need some grace. Our administrators will need grace in enacting these settings. They're all um, 
you know, a little bit unusual. We have had a test run, obviously, in the spring, but this isn't something we plan for. And this is something that we have a very strong plan to implement moving forward, where we will also support our staff with professional development, which is one of the reasons we ask for some additional time at the start of the year. When we look at the next slide, it's a, a nice summary of what's going to happen in terms of digital academy. So when we think about this new option, this option where students have the opportunity to engage in completely asynchronous learning with some assigned um, lessons for a teacher as mentioned previously. In this particular op option of the digital academy, we are going to see new platforms. Last year when it was time and we had a few days to select these um, platforms in March and it was days, um, we picked existing platforms. We found that they served the purpose at the time, but they weren't the best opportunity for students to learn. And they, they didn't always meet all of our needs. So moving forward, we were looking for in teams of teachers and leaders. We looked at various platforms that were available on the market. In that, that search, we decided to replace one of our existing platforms used in VCAP and looked at Ingenuity for our K-8 students. This offers opportunities for students to learn at the elementary level. It also offers very designed um, activities where they're interactive dynamic for students throughout the middle school level. We felt this was necessary for our online self-paced learning. Our other platform really wasn't designed for online self-paced learning. We also then looked at what happens at the nine to 12 level. And knowing that there were things that we needed to find special exceptions, we needed something that was NCAA friendly and acceptable for NCAA as well as college admission. Apex Learning offers that. And we looked for platforms that were specifically available for those purposes. So in, in our high school space, if they are in the digital academy, they will be working with the Apex Learning. Now this is contrary to what we would have in the remote setting where they're using digital resources at assigned times during their course time. If we look at this also, the one thing that's very important to know and to be um, cognizant of is that we have registration for this digital academy that will occur between July 13th and August 1st. And they'll do this typically in the same setting. Um, I think this was mentioned previously by Dr. Klein that it'll be just like they would in any other type of enrollment process. They would need to log in, they would need to select this option. And of course, if there are questions, people at central enrollment would certainly be willing to answer those questions and, and guide them through the process. But this is very important that parents opt in during this window so that we can plan accordingly. We will need to staff this, mo this model. As we move into the next slide, this is a summary of those high school options and I won't um, belabor this. We did share this pretty specifically in the prior slides. Um, the one thing to take away again is that there are specific self-paced platforms for the high school digital space. Um, and then there are new curriculum adoptions that are a combination of digital and print resources. There are combinations, again, of um, teacher supplemented lessons, but mostly teacher led in that remote high school space, supplemented in that self paced learning environment. So if you're looking for more of an asynchronous, kind of at your own pace, the digital academy might best suit your needs. If you're looking for a space where there are certain prescribed times that you log in for teacher directed lessons for assignments, that remote high school learning space would be more of a, an appropriate selection. As we move into the next slide, this summarizes our K to eight options. So if you're looking for, again, that self-paced, even K to eight, there's a platform that we have, uh, we've recently identified that offers that more dynamic interactive learning experience um, with teacher supplementals. In terms of the lesson planning, the Digital Academy would be more for you if it's more of an asynchronous option that you're looking for. If you're looking for more of a traditional setting, that time frame where students come to school on certain days, have remote extended learning on other days using a combination of digital and print resources that have been recently adopted, the blended learning option for our pre-K to eight actually, students would be more of your um, election. And as we move into the next slide, so this next slide talks about here's what it looks like. And so when you look at the slide that follows, our blended learning, we had to follow guided principles, best practice principles. We wanted to make sure that that blended experience is always safe and it's always healthy. We made sure that we set clear protocols for when students stay home, new expectations, routines, procedures, cleaning methods that we are using. We considered what will keep students safe while at school. 
There'll be differences. It won't look the same as it did prior to COVID-19. There'll be other environments where students may stay in the classroom, you know, in terms of eating lunch. They may have resources at certain times in certain areas and not be able to convene with other students in other settings because we would need to maintain those more, um, you know, safety uh, ratio guidelines. You'll also notice that when we talk about this, not only are we building those routines, there's some health policies for, for both formal and informal spaces. There's limitations to visitors. There are probably staffing changes that we might notice. For example, less dependence on itinerant teachers that come into the building and share spaces and go into other buildings. So we'll see some of that moving forward. The other guided principle, and this is a, a really key factor that we have embedded in all settings, but a focus on so social and emotional learning and support. So we will see trauma-informed practices. We will go deeper with restorative justice. We will also build um, community around proven practices, such as the morning and closing circles. We will listen to student voice. We'll ask students to, um, to consider social and emotional learning related to PPE and the COVID restrictions that we have in place, give students space to talk about those things, talk about the adjustments to their new environments. Um, and so there'll be a heavy balance between uh, that approach to social and emotional learning and supporting students' emotional needs, as well as, report, as um, being committed to their academic learning. And so in the academic space, you're going to see high quality teaching, you'll see rigorous learning experiences, we will do essential standards, uh, we will use unobtrusive formative assessment that teachers will monitor learning so that they can provide on the spot adjustments for students before they go into those remote spaces. And you'll also see a difference in the structure of those class formats. We will support access, engagement, and achievement of students, and we will work to build independent learners, as well as give them opportunities to extend their thinking in a project-based type setting. We will work on things such as flipped learning in these models. And as we move into the next piece, the next slide, you'll also see that there is a reminder here that there's going to be two days in person, and then also three days of remote learning at home. So students from the same household, the same family will attend in-person classrooms on the same day. Um, as a convenience for parents and making sure that that's a, an assistance for those parents as well. So when we move into this sample schedule, this is sort of what this might look like during those remote days. That was probably what parents most want to hear. What's it going to look like on days that students are at home? So you'll notice that the orange boxes, the peach boxes, they're days at home. That's the remote for this blended sample schedule in an elementary room. And the middle school will look very similar as well. So while students are in class, they will get their core instruction. They will also then get instruction in other areas. And we have a schedule here particularly um, demonstrating what happens at the elementary. At home, we will have adults touch base with students. They'll offer remote lessons. Similar to what you'd see in that high school space where teachers are offering direct instruction in their content area and offering it to students during specific times. So even while there's an asynchronous piece to this remote instruction, there are still scheduled times that synchronous learning. You'll notice that it will incorporate um, social and emotional learning during that time. There'll be virtual class meetings. And this is a space where students will get to see all classmates. So it won't just be their smaller cohort, but everybody that's assigned to that class, allowing them to extend their friendships, allowing them to see their peers in that larger class setting, but in this remote learning format. And so again, students will have those virtual class meetings. We will support them, making sure that staff are connecting with students when they're on their own in these more remote spaces to not only troubleshoot with students, but also to address needs that may arise with families as needed during that time frame. And so as we move into the next slide, you're going to notice there's a specific connection for our early childhood, our pre-K space. This will look differently depending on student needs. We will still have two days of in-person learning and then we'll have three days of remote learning at home. There will be platforms that can be utilized during that time. There will also be more traditional assignments. Students will take home paper assignments. They will take home projects. They will take home things that parents can also support at home. And part of our work that hasn't been mentioned on any of the slides is we're having parent academies. Uh, I believe it was just as recently as yesterday, we had a very large parent academy talking about the new resources, talking about what this might look like in our upcoming school year. And so we would encourage parents to engage in those parent academies to get more information, to also get some support around how do I support students at home. 
if you are in that digital space where your students learn at an asynchronous rate, that requires a different level of parent involvement. And that's part of the consideration when we're selecting an option next year. In our early childhood space, students may have that three days of remote, but we have, will have some students that will come more often. Those tend to be our students with special needs or other considerations. And we will see those students coming more um, in half day settings, possibly in classrooms with adults and working on their assignments um, with adults mostly in the, the more face-to-face -face, um, setting. There will also be some virtual at-home learning assignments that will happen on that fifth day. And so when we think about what's, what's what the opportunities are as we move into our next slide, we look at the, the situation in terms of blended. So just as a reminder, if you're selecting this blended option, you are looking at provide or having in-person learning for two of those days. It could be a Monday, Tuesday, it could be a Thursday, Friday. Um, we will also have teachers and school-based staff provide support on days that students aren't in school. So during that remote setting, just like you saw for that uh, elementary example, you'll see similar at the secondary level. There'll be touch points with adults on days that students are working remotely. We'll also have different staff development opportunities because this is a new space for many of our teachers and a new space for all of us. There aren't even any studies on what's good um, instruction during a crisis, a pandemic. We haven't had one of those. We do have some instruction on what has happened or some guidance around professional development for teachers teaching in that all remote space, that online learning um, space like you'll see in the digital academy, but not necessarily all these other combinations. So as we're moving forward, professional development will be key and it will happen on those Wednesdays typically it, as to not interrupt and also to protect other instructional time. We have additional considerations and we still have work groups moving forward. Our work groups were extensive to get to this place, but they'll continue. We need to continue to have discussion around supporting special education students, students with more complex needs. What will that look like? Our English language learners, we have new programs for limited English proficiency students. We have new digital and print resources, and we'll need to have further conversation on how do we blend that into our work and our formats and put it that into our schedules. And then we have that career and technical education that we just spoke about in a prior um, board meeting where we were bringing in, and I believe that you're um, receiving information on looking at ways to bring in students to a more traditional setting with these COVID restrictions, these guidelines in place to allow students to get their hours for CTE programs. We also have some CTE teachers that have been working very closely with us with tremendous ideas on how do I help students demonstrate these competencies regardless of setting, whether I can offer it in person, how do I share it, how do I make sure that they're, they're mastering their content. And as we move forward, we will need to consider, consider international baccalaureate and advanced placement. Both of these programs have guidelines that come from national agencies, actually an international baccalaureate, international agencies that are focusing on how we must deliver this. And so as we receive guidance, you may see flexibility. For our dual enrollment, we also have consideration, they're not listed here, but we will follow the institutions for which students are enrolled and we will continue to offer that programming for students and support it as we had during the closure in the spring. And so as I, I finish on this slide, I want to turn this over to um, looking at our social and emotional um, learning and the, the places that are there. We did mention this already. So this is just a summary slide of that information. We will continue to address current issues. We, we want to give kids a space to talk about what they're experiencing. We will work with community building. We will also continue to support agencies that work with our students and work on what does that look like? Will it be in a remote format? Um, we know we need to limit visitors to the, the actual face-to-face -face settings. And so we'll need to have further conversation around that based on guidance that we receive. We also have a very targeted plan for social and emotional learning as well as mental health services. We now have a school counseling program that is in place and that will begin next year. Um, we have specific staff roles for those that support behavior and social and emotional learning. Um, and we will look, look at these as we progress through and definitely with the changing landscape. And so at this point, I will turn this over to our chief information officer. Um, this would be um, Ms. Verney. Thank you, Dr. Ocasio. Uh, good evening, CCS family. I hope your energy levels are uh, very high at this early evening hours. Um, I'm very excited 
uh, with all that intentionality and planning that went into um, discussing with you tonight our preliminary plans for reopening the school year. Now, uh, if you heard a common theme across the discussions, uh, across the plans, Dr. Chapman, Dr. Ocasio, and Dr. Klein uh, laid out in front of you, you heard the word technology used a lot. Um, so what are we doing in terms of uh, making sure technology um, continues to support the learning of the students, continues to support our uh, reopening plans? In the spring, when we um, closed school buildings, Temporarily, um, we gave out uh, close to 20,000 devices loaned um, uh, Chromebooks to our students. We reached 62% of our households, but we understand a lot of these households had multiple students using the same device. We understand there's a gap of more than 20,000 uh, students that may need devices to carry out either our blended learning approach or our CCS Digital Academy in the fall. So we are uh, in the process of securing funding sources to procure these devices. And once they're secured, we will ensure that every student will have the device in their hands when school reopens in the fall. Um, so access to technology is not just devices, it is also the internet. So in the short term, we'll continue to assess our data that's coming in through surveys and other, um, you know, other outreach and engagement efforts we undertake as a district, and we will be giving hotspots to families that need them. In the long term, we are actually working with other stakeholders in the city to embrace broadband access as a public utility and how to give it to families in the city of Columbus. So we continue to be a major voice in that uh, community effort and we'll continue to do so. And this is a long-term plan um, about six to 12 months out there. Once you have access to technology, what are the considerations, right? When, when we did, um, start virtual learning uh, this uh, spring, we understood that a lot of our parents and students did not have an opportunity to be onboarded on the technology tools and resources, including devices, how to charge them, you know, internet access, how to turn on your hotspot device, a variety of things. So we are going to be very intentional about providing those onboarding and training opportunities, not only to our staff and teachers, but also to our students and parents and guardians. Stay tuned, we will be, um, we will be sharing specific plans in the future. We will continue to provide office hours at our Kingswood data center twice a week for repairs and replacements. We understand devices will come up for repair or lost or stolen, or you, know, you just left it out in the summer on the top of your car. We understand those things happen and we will be helping you get learning to continue and not stop. So we will be doing repairs and replacement twice a week during the school year. And uh, <clears throat> if, you're, uh, if you're wondering if everybody is going to be streaming from the schools, if the teachers are going to be reaching out to students virtually, do you have enough infrastructure in the schools? I can assure you, we have sufficient infrastructure and bandwidth, network bandwidth in our schools to enable technology um, integration. And we will be closely monitoring the situation and we have the ability to turn up the speeds in our school buildings if needed, um, if we come to that point. What is our really long-term vision? We want to be a one-to-one -one device district by the start of school year 2022-2023. Our vision is to make technology a part of our culture of Columbus City Schools by the start of school year 2022. Thank you. And now I'll turn on to Dr. Chapman um, to continue um, her considerations and our plan around uh, other services in the district. Thank you. So we have considered um, the guidance from the CDC, the guidance from our health professionals, and we have landed on some strong recommendations as relates to health and safety. We recognize that as we think about implementing social distancing in schools, we will have to revamp most, if not all, of our day-to-day -day operations from classroom space to schedules to adhere to the public health guidance. We are requiring that all staff, um, employees, administrators, teachers wear masks while at work. We are requiring all of our students to wear masks on buses. 
and we are recommending that our students also wear masks while in school. For social distancing, we are going to work diligently to ensure that all spaces adhere to six feet of distancing in the classrooms and all common areas. We will install physical barriers where necessary. In addition, as it relates to classroom space, we will make sure that the homeroom class stays in place where teachers rotate as opposed to the students changing classrooms. We will also make sure that all of our desks are facing the same direction to ensure um, that we are, again, practicing social distancing and that um, the seating lends itself to that. As it relates to students' individual classroom space, we will make sure, again, that students stay with the same cohort of students throughout the day. So students will be grouped in cohorts. They will eat, they will eat together. They will go to recess together. They will transition as a group to any other spaces in the building um, if they need access to those spaces. And we will also ensure that adequate supplies are available to minimize sharing of high touch materials to the extent possible. And we will also explore um, ways that we can utilize our outdoor space as an extended classroom when appropriate. As it relates to hygiene, we will ensure that all of our campuses have hand sanitizer readily available for student and staff use. We will encourage and recommend thorough hand washing um, throughout the day, during the days where students are attending um, school in person. We will ask parents, guardians to um, conduct health assessments of their students before sending their students to school. We will certainly rely on our parents and guardians to make arrangements for pickup of students if they um, become ill during the course of the school day. And staff are asked to do self-assessments before reporting to work. As it relates to cleaning and disinfecting, we will ensure that we thoroughly clean and disinfect all of our school buildings each night after in-person classes. Um, our team will be using a hospital grade disinfectant and electrostatic disinfectant sprayers to ensure that we are appropriately um, sanitizing and disinfecting any of the classroom spaces, supplies, materials, and furniture. Additional recommendations, we will limit visitors or volunteers to the school buildings. Again, we, are, we need to make sure that we keep the cohort groups of students in their classrooms um, intact. And we will also um, limit any in-person field trips. In lieu of in-person field trips, we will certainly recommend or encourage virtual field trip experiences. We are also going to be asking all of our staff and students to use fillable water bottles and not drink directly from the water fountains that we have in the building. Again, those will be supplied by the district. As it relates to our operations and budget, we have a few more um, recommendations that we'd like to provide this evening for consideration before wrapping up. As it relates to food services, we will continue to provide free breakfast and lunch to all students each school day. When students are in school, meals will be consumed in the classroom. We will not return to our cafeteria-like experience for our students and staff. We will be asking, the, again, as we're practicing social distancing, we will be asking all of our students to remain with their cohort group and they will have breakfast and lunch in the classroom. Each student will be given six to-go meals when they leave the school building. That will account for two meals per day of remote learning when they are learning at home. And we will continue with the grab and go meal distribution where high school students can pick up 10 meals for the week. As you can imagine, as we continue to think about the recommendations and the considerations for reopening in the fall, these recommendations will not come without increased expenses. In order to protect the health and safety of our students, meet the social distancing guidelines, adhere to the health and safety guidance, um, meet the increased technology needs, of course, 
All of our students will need a device. All of our teachers will need a device. And we will also need to consider increased needs related to staffing to ensure that we have ample staff to um, support our students with the blended model of instruction as well as virtual and to cover classes as needed in the event of teacher absences. And now I would like to turn it over to our treasurer, Stan, to share a little bit more details about the budget implications. Hey, thank you, Dr. Chapman. And um, a little more detail is, is correct. Uh, <laughs> and um, as you can imagine, all the work groups that um, uh, worked on preparing this, um, these proposed plans for you this evening, part of that uh, included uh, coming up with a cost estimate for all the pieces and parts that will be necessary as, as uh, was just mentioned on the previous slide, all those things that are gonna be necessary to, to execute on these plans. Um, <clears throat> Budget Director Gooding and I did a compilation of that data just uh, yesterday. And at this point, um, our estimate is that, that these requirements will run up to uh, probably 100, close to $100 million. And this includes uh, both one-time expenses uh, that will be incurred just for next school year and others will be um, issues and items and, and, and functions that we put into place that will, will stay in place on a recurring basis. So um, we're in the process now that having uh, uh, tabulated that information on those costs, we're reviewing them, we're going back to the work groups to make sure that um, uh, you know, everything's in the, in the right place, that we, we know exactly how um, the costs were calculated uh, and then when we looked at where we're we going to get the funds for this, um, there is federal funding and the CARES Act legislation. Now, the district will receive uh, a net amount of about $27 million. And, and I say that because uh, the actual allocation is $30.9 million, but that includes funding for non-public schools in there. And that calculation has not been finalized, but we've got an estimate of between 4 to $5 million, um, out of that out of that 30.9 million that will probably go to non-publics. And so any, any of the expenses, as you can see here, that aren't covered by the CARES Act would come from our general fund. So uh, we're probably looking at a, in, in that 72, $73 million range right now to um, hit the general fund uh, at least that, that first year uh, um, in fiscal year 2021. So as we go uh, and do further reviews of this, um, find some things that maybe be redundant that we can eliminate, um, obviously search for other, other funding that might be available. Uh, we'll keep everyone up to date with where we are on that. But right now, um, it's, a, it's a fairly sizable dollar amount of $100 million that uh, will, will be additional expense to the district um, for uh, implementing these plans. So with that in mind, I believe Dr. Dixon is up to do a final summary and closure before uh, we um, perhaps take questions. Yes, thanks, Dan. Uh, we'll get to the next slide. Next steps. So in order to operationalize and implement these recommendations, um, we must remember that we will need additional guidance from ODE, CDC, in our Ohio Department of Health. Um, these, and these changes, uh, we've been seeing daily changes, sometimes weekly changes. So we know that we will have to um, uh, follow their guidance. Agreements with our labor union partners, their agreements, um, we're working closely with our labor union um, leaders um, to make sure that um, we are um, meeting those um, um, meeting those agreements and having conversation about what that means in this new setting. And please remember, I have to keep reminding people that we're at a global pandemic. This is not business as usual. Um, and so we all have to be flexible and nimble and rethinking how we offer um, education to our students and our families. I know we, none of us have ever seen this time before. Um, as one of our um, leaders stated earlier, there's no um, template that districts use to guide us. Um, we uh, receive guidance from other entities, 
but we're using our, um, our, our best, uh, we're looking at research um, and using our expertise to guide this plan. Um, and so please remember that. Um, and feasibility and budget resources, um, as Stan just stated, we're looking up possibly up to $100 million. And, and we will know, we know that these costs um, um, uh, are going to uh, be more than what we, any of district have anticipated, but we wanna make sure that we are offering the best educational program um, with the budget and the resources that we have available to us. Um, please be reminded, re registration for CCS Digital Academy will begin July 13th through August 1st. Um, and there are options for all students K-12. We will have updated information on our website. We will have a Q&A on our website and we will be updating the website and informing our stakeholders um, as those changes come. We know that there is a meeting with the governor, there's a press conference with the governor on Thursday. As soon as we receive additional information or new information, we will update um, all of you. Um, again, thank you for uh, uh, your patience. Thank you for understanding that we don't have all the answers right now, but our goal as I stated before is to offer the best educational program for our students and making sure that we're meeting the guidelines, the health and safety guidelines um, there um, for all of our students and be able to open up schools knowing that we have these, um, these challenges of, of, of meeting some of these guidelines. Social distancing is important. We have to do that. We have to make sure that it's done in our school buildings. We understand that some of our school buildings are larger than others, and there will be a challenge to making sure that we have all of our students um, there. That's why we're going with the cohort model for our pre-K through eight. And again, we're, we hope to hear some more information about transportation um, on Friday. So that's, um, that, ends our that ends our presentation, um, that will end the presentation uh, President Adair, I will turn it back to you for any um, questions you have of me um, and the team. Yes, we have questions. Um, we will begin with board member Cole. Um, thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you all for this uh, very uh, robust uh, presentation. Um, I appreciate the thought and planning that went into it. Um, I definitely also want to thank all of the folks who are not here present um, to be able to get the shine, uh, those working groups that put so much work and elbow grease into trying to get this plan together for us and for our students. I have uh, just four quick questions. My first is um, how much consideration was given, particularly for the pre-K to eight um, grades? How much consideration was given to the idea of parents availability to be at home with their children um, during this time of instruction, um, uh, whether it's asynchronic or synchronic, how, how much was that a, a factor at all? I would offer that it was a huge factor. I think that when we thought about pre-K through eight attending school in person two days a week and learning from home three days a week, we had to prioritize and consider how we would ensure that we were practicing social distancing in the classrooms. So we could not have all of our students in the building at one time to ensure that we really adhere to the social distancing guidelines. So that again, that was our number one priority um, in thinking about how we could provide in-person instruction for our students, as well as practice social distancing, uh, recognizing that um, this was the, the best of both worlds that we could certainly recommend. Okay, I thank you for that. Um, the second question is about that uh, special group of a set of groups of students, those who are special ed students, English language learners, ELLs, career tech, 
um, International Baccalaureate and Advanced Placement. How soon will these students and their families know when uh, or what their schedules, what their, their learning schedules will actually be, since they will be the ones that will be spending more time in the buildings? So board member Cole, one of the things that's going to happen moving forward is our team of special educators that we're having work over the summer to review IEPs. We're looking to offer as much opportunity for students with more complex needs to get more of that face-to-face -face and still be able to maintain these spacing requirements and these other social distance requirements. Um, we are hoping to get that information out very quickly, um, but it will take some time. There are many IEPs that they're going to have to review to see if they can um, make some of these circumstances work. In terms of our um, English language learners, we will be looking again as well with space and how we could provide them space in the building for students with more um, limited English proficiency. So it wouldn't be just because I have an IEP, I would come to the building more, or just because I've been identified as an English language learner, it would be based on needs. And so it would be those with IEPs that have more complex needs, and then those also with uh, limited English proficiency. We wouldn't be able to bring in all of our else and we wouldn't be able to bring in all of our special education students and still maintain those distancing guidelines and also the class ratios. Um, so we're, we're going to need to make some decisions around that. In terms of AP and international baccalaureate, we may provide extended opportunities, but it may not be in the form of bringing them in face to face. We may need to supplement that. One of the things that we'll need to consider is the testing avenue. And so this year testing was suspended in some ways or done differently than other ways uh, in other years. Because as you may know um, from experiences that IB testing happened in person with certain conditions. And they changed some of that because everyone was faced with this national crisis, this international crisis actually. Um, so we're going to need to wait for guidance in terms of IB or AP classes. Um, I'm trying to think if there was any other special ed population that we mentioned. CET. Here. C -E -T. C -T -E, yes. Um, so one of the things that um, you may recall or that we may have talked about, or I'm trying to think of when this was last uh, shared, I think it was last board meeting actually, we are looking at this summer doing some face-to-face -face work with our CTE students. And there's a very comprehensive plan that um, Celeste Lewis, our director, and Kate King, our nursing director, worked on. And so they not only worked on this to make sure that they were providing appropriate guidance, but they were also looking to make sure that um, they could offer these experiences in a safe way. And so certain programs we felt needed to come in for licensure and to get their credentialing. We're going to consider looking at that again um, to see if there are opportunities for those types of boot camp credentialing types of camps, whatever we want to call them, to make sure that students are getting their needs met. And we're working on this test run this summer to kind of help inform that, that work. I appreciate that. If we're thinking about a timeline, we know that school is going to begin after Labor Day, uh, September 8th, I think it is. Um, are we thinking August that we'll have this information that parents will know? I, I we love anticipate that. August possibly summer. earlier for special education students or for ELs. Um, and it would also, one of the things that informs us is that deadline for applying to the digital academy because that helps us understand our ratios for students that are coming in person. So some of these things, there are just many moving parts. Sometimes we're waiting on information from other entities that are outside of the district. And in this case, we'll need to know some information regarding to who wants to select which option, knowing that there is a, a a real cohort of students that will go into that digital space based on our survey data, but our survey data was only representative of those that responded. So we can't have a great estimate of it. We just have a, a specific estimate right now. Okay, I, I thank you for that. Um, my other question is around rigor, and this will probably be my last one. I'll kind of combine them. Um, I appreciate some of the software platforms that you guys showed us as example that will be utilized for student learning. Um, you talked about how attendance and that piece would be measured. What about mastery? What are we, what are we thinking about in terms of understanding how, what, what the depth of understanding the student actually has with the curriculum? I, I, as important as it is for the attendance, and that is absolutely critical, we want to monitor that. But I think it's, 
even more essential that we peel that layer of attendance and now go into exploring what is the depth of understanding of a student on these virtual platforms. And so I love that question. Regardless of options or uh, that is are selected by families, students will require to do be required to do more than just participate. Our kids are the next epidemiologists. We're going to need them to be prepared, and we're going to need to make sure that they're learning what they need to learn at each grade level. And so, in terms of taking attendance, we do have opportunities through the systems, and Dr. Klein has worked extensively on how to do this based on regulations around taking attendance in these programs. However, we are also working from our plan. We had an MTSS framework. We had a robust group of um, conditions for learning that our team put together throughout the year prior to the pandemic. Part of that is a comprehensive assessment plan. And with our new adoptions, we have the opportunity to, to monitor learning in a different way than we had in the past. So we are able to monitor standards mastery throughout with some of these new programs. And we are looking at incorporating short cycle assessments. Also, if you'll recall, when we talked about our learning management, learning management system, it came with an assessment management system. So students will have to demonstrate mastery of these concepts. And so we want families to understand that regardless of option that you select, students will be asked to show that they're, they're learning. They're not just participating. Um, clicking in is not enough. And so we, we need families to understand that as they're selecting. Okay, I, I, I thank you. I thank you, Madam President. Board Member Cole. Yes, ma'am. This is Michelle. I just wanted to share with you that question number three on our parent guardian survey specifically asked for parents and guardians to complete the following statement. If school buildings are closed, someone will be able and available to care for and supervise my child or children during school hours on non-school days. And out of the 10,839 parents guardians that responded, 4,459 of them said someone would be available five days a week. Another 1,464 said there would be no one available. And a 1,954 said, I do not know at this time. So I just wanted to give you an estimate of the responses from our parents and guardians that responded to the survey, specifically with regard to your question. No, I, I thank you. Those are still considerable numbers. Um, and I, I realized that this is a sample population Correct. Um, <laughs> that was surveyed, uh, but it is still a very essential question in that uh, we wanna make sure that families are able to be in some way, shape, form, or fashion accommodated. And perhaps I, I realize that is outside of our, our, our lane, so to speak. Um, but I do know that we can lean on our partners outside of ourselves to see where we can provide those services. So thank, thank you. you. Vice President Reyes. Thank you. Thank you again. That is a lot of information, a lot to digest, and I'm sure parents probably will have a lot more questions after this uh, uh, deliberation, or not deliberation, our, our, our conversation. Uh, so I'll try to combine a couple of questions also and then yield and if I have to come back. Um, when will um, students know their schedules? When, when will that be announced? And when it is announced, can a parent coordinate what dates their child could be in person and then uh, virtual? Board member Reyes, this is Michelle. Just as an FYI for you, we will actually be assigning the cohorts for pre-K to eighth grade students according to households so that it helps with the convenience for the parent. So if I have a first grader and a fourth grader, um, they'll be going to school on the same days. That is going to be done electronically through our student information management system. There is a new release coming out the first week in July, and we will be using that and assessing it. Um, that may or may not fit on the parent's schedule, and we will have an opportunity for parents to adjust that if it is necessary. So again, all students in the same household um, in K to eight will go to school on the same days for parent convenience. Perfect. So in that vein, how 
will we ensure that all parents are aware of their options, understand their options and the deadlines? Will we have a concerted effort that every parent, whether they're current or new, uh, are aware and have somebody to communicate with them about each of their children? Oh, you muted yourself, Dr. Klein. That's a great question. So what we're going to do is we'll be sending information out via the parent portal. Now remember only about 70% of our parents use the parent portal. So we are going to lean on our building principals, secretaries also to facilitate that and to make any additional changes that need to be made because you as a parent might have a particular schedule and you might have to adjust it. And so we wanna make sure that we have as many options available to parents as possible. Perfect, and I, must, and, and I know it goes without saying that we'll have it in multiple languages and have um, the, the additional help that our parents will need. It, it's, it's complicated, it's a new world. Uh, I, I mean, if it's um, kind of hard for us to digest, I can just imagine for some of our parents, especially that have multiple issues going on right now with uh, being impacted by COVID. Um, so, with that said, will there be any initiatives to help parents and students remember their schedule? Because um, it's going to take a little while. So are we going to have kind of a lead time? One of the things that we're looking at, um, as we had last year, is looking at the staff that are available in buildings and having them support students. We also have worked with um, Ms. Gillison. We've talked about the parent liaisons helping as well with that so that families are being supported by multiple adults and there are multiple touch points. I know that that is something that we've discussed, not just the school counselor working with students, not just the social worker, but having multiple staff in the building. It may be the instructional assistants. I know that um, some of our uh, union leadership have said they're willing to help um, have their staff do other roles so that everyone supports learning. And we were excited to hear, you know, that other people are also wor um, working and expecting to support learning in that way. So it may be someone that typically wouldn't call families may actually be used in order to do this because we do know this will be a learning curve and families will have questions. And we've had some great staff that have stepped up and even offered to do this before asked. Perfect. Will a student or parent be able to change their selection? Say, say a student is not doing well remotely or vice versa, or perhaps they are injured, sick, or unable to attend in person and maybe might want to go virtual. Board member Ray has two um, answers for you. The first one is yes, and the second one is yes. Um, I just want to make sure that you know that we also have our ESL call center that one of our principals just texted me about to remind you um, to support students and parents in all languages. And so Michael Sane and his team will be using that as well. But if a parent needs to change their mind, we are certainly going to make sure we do whatever is best for the student. And I do wanna mention that the CCS Digital Academy will be for one year. It is not certain whether or not these Ohio Department of Education will continue it after a year. So we will have to see, but we are going to commit for a full year. So I'm hopeful, Dr. Klein, that that also means that uh, I think uh, Dr. Cassio may have mentioned this, the short cycle assessment um, that will utilize that as a, a, a tool for interventions. If a child is not doing well, because sometimes our, you know, as parents, we may not be able to catch what's not going on and have uh, an opportunity for us to reach out to parents and talk about some intervention to get a child on the right path? Absolutely, board member Reyes. In addition, we will have a testing center for our virtual academy so that we can be assured of validity of testing. So we're already working with curriculum on that now. And I'll just say one last question and yield to others. So, we're introducing these plans, understanding there may be an impact of transportation. So if, and I'm just putting this out there because I think it, it may need to be said is if we get back a uh, recommendation from the state, the CDC or how the 
Department of Health, whatever those other entities that state and make it difficult for transportation. Uh, we'll, we'll, it'll probably blow up the whole plan as I just says how Carol go like this. I mean, I, considering that we have a probably about what 50% of our families that rely on transportation to come to school. And I don't know if that's a Dr. Dixon uh, question, uh, but I, I just want, I, I think it's important for everyone to understand that transportation could have a huge impact on all these plans that we're presenting today. Yes, you're correct. And that's why we stated, I stated earlier that there's an, uh, the governor is going to update us with some guidance and we hope to hear something about transportation on Thursday. Um, but currently uh, with the current guidelines, you can only transport so many students and still meet the social distancing guidelines. And um, in addition to servicing our students, remember we also um, transport our charters and non-public students. So um, we will be transporting students for uh, a, a, a large portion of the day with the current guidelines. Um, and so that would be challenging for us um, as well as the opportunity to work with our um, charter and non-public uh, partners to make sure that this will be doable. But you're correct, transportation is, is a concern. If for some reason to your question that we cannot transport students for whatever that reason is, then we would definitely have to look at another educational model. Um, we can't move this model forward if we can't transport students. And then with some other considerations, we'll have to, uh, we would have to make some other decisions if we cannot transport students. Perfect, thank you. I yield to my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, board member Beckerley. I'm piggybacking on um, what uh, Vice President Reyes just said uh, about the survey. First of all, I just want to compliment or commend the administration. You know, a year ago, that survey wouldn't have been possible. I mean, we, you built the bandwidth and the capacity and you had the engagement team in place and it's really remarkable. And um, I'm very, very excited that we've gotten this far in terms of engagement and our um, capacity to reach out to our families. Um, having said that, um, and this is, um, as I said, piggybacking on what Vice President Reyes said, I think I'm hoping that we can be very intentional about reaching those we haven't reached, even if it means, you know, phone calls, knocking on doors, that sort of thing. And, you know, maybe even rely on our partners to do some of that. Um, you know, or maybe uh, I think Someone mentioned union members who have been willing to do things that are not not typically their roles. Um, and this board member is happy to participate any way she can to help reach out to those families. Because I think it's really important that we understand what their needs are um, and we make sure they understand what their options are. Because, you know, there's a there's certainly some segment of our parent family population that are not connected and we and, and it's gonna be important to connect them in order for them to participate. So um, I just want to encourage that and say that I'm willing to help in any way I can, including knocking on doors. That's all. Uh, thank you. And I will add that we do have a, and it was um, alluded to earlier, an engagement strategy. So there will be um, a intentional focus on engaging parents um, and um, who want to, there will be an online learning platform for them. Uh, we would train them on how to use these digital uh, resources, yeah. how to check their students' work, what to look for. So all of that is uh, intentional, and um, Alicia Gillison and that engagement team will be leading that that work. Yeah, I, I, I love the parent academies. So that's terrific. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Pierce. 
Um, thank you. So I, I have a couple of questions. My first question is um, one, looking at this survey, our participation numbers are in fact low. Um, when we look at the student survey, what efforts were made to engage our students via social media or through the superintendent's ambassadors program? Dr. Pierce, this is Michelle to your question. Our family engagement team actually led the way. This particular survey was not done by accountability, but I know that they did the emails, they did social media, um, and um, it was put out. The one thing that I think if we had to do um, in retrospect would be that we would have done that particular survey earlier when students was, were still in school because I think we might have gotten a higher percentage. Um, the majority of the responses were from high school students because our elementary students aren't using their email at this time very much. Thank you. Um, my next, thank you, Dr. Klein. So my next question I think might be for Dr. Acasio. Um, you indicate that we will take measures to ensure that students have mastery for the 2021-2022 school year. Is that mastery going to be based on state standards or will that mastery be based on our new curriculum um, that we've been directed to engage given our uh, PDK audit? So they're not um, exclusive of one or the other. Our state standards are the thing that we lead with because our Department of Ed requires that. However, we use our curriculum resources then to address the state standard and to offer instructional opportunities that allow students to demonstrate mastery of the standard by the end of the school year. So I guess the question is yes and yes. Um, our curriculum will be the vehicle, but the end, you know, the means is the curriculum, but the end goal is to be addressing those state standards, but not just the state standards in the sense of how they're measured. So this is the other part of this, and this is why I'd mentioned about engaging students in higher level thinking, engaging them in more deeper learning when I gave that example, or engaging them in project-based type work. We are embedding design type thinking in our curriculum because our state standards or our state test, not the standard itself, but our test only measures that DOK3, that analysis level work. The only time we even get to DOK4, which is that more extended, that generating a hypothesis and testing it, the only time we get there is on assessments that are locally based. Um, the, the assessment itself, the state test does not address that. Um, except it does do a little bit of touching on it with the, the writing response, but for the most part, we're not getting there. It doesn't mean, and we've worked on this in professional development this entire year prior to COVID, it doesn't mean we don't give those experiences. So for example, um, if I'm doing a, a lesson that talks about oppression across the, the um, you know, the countries, you know, internationally, and I share with students in world history, um, the essay shooting of an elephant. I share with them what happened in Wall Street, uh, on, on Black Wall Street in Oklahoma. I share with them other types of content where people were experiencing oppression at the same time. I could give them an extended um, project that would deepen their learning. They would have to express more of that DOK type thinking. They could do a projective investigation. That's what our um, professional development is designed in doing this year. We're taking that idea of let's talk about the standard that you're trying to master, but also those kinds of projective, investi projective investigations, it makes relevance. It deepens that learning experience. Another example might be if in American history, and I do an American studies type of focus, and I use President Obama's speech in 2008 when he did his inaugural speech, he referenced the Four Freedoms document that was that happened century or not centuries but years before many years before he also referenced in that some langston hughes references so that's that cross-curricular piece i could then have students extend their thinking more of that dok4 to have them take a, a contemporary event and then model their speech that use of rhetoric at that ninth tenth grade level to extend what they're learning in american history and apply it to contemporary times so while we're asking them to demonstrate the standards they'll measure on the test, we're also asking for deeper learning. And that's something that we're putting into our curriculum guides. It was work we did pre-COVID. Um, so when you, you talk about that, that measures what we are looking for in the PDK audit, where it goes beyond what's going to be assessed at the state level, but it also deepens the learning experience and it makes it memorable for students. It creates that relevance. 
So I ask that yes, yes in the long I think we can anticipate that some of our state standards might change. And I love the examples that you use because those examples bring in our unified arts. When we talk about public speaking, when we talk about um, visualization of the oppression that people face. Um, our model right now has our unified arts happening on days when they're at home. So how do we, are there ways to work around that? Um, you know, in particular, my fifth grader had to do her music this year at home. And I was not the best music teacher when it came to bells and drums, even though I played them in middle school, there was a lot I forgot. So how are we anticipating to provide that, that in class, that time that's needed for unified arts? And I'll go one step deeper, extracurricular activities like chess club, um, makerspace, destination imagination, how are we providing those? We are also working with groups. I mentioned that this is the initial part of the plan, but there's still deeper work to happen in those specialized areas. We need to figure out um, how do those intramurals happen? How do those extracurriculars happen? We're working to get more guidance around sports. There are some things that we can't make decisions around right now, but much of what you're, you're talking about is something that we are going to have to investigate further. And we, we did this plan in phases. This is what's necessary to start because we need enrollment numbers at this moment. We need people to have an opportunity to enroll if they want that digital space based on the survey results, which again, are a smaller selection. It's a sampling. Um, some of those things we're addressing, we're even looking at ways to do choir. Um, and we know that with this pandemic that people have been told that you know, singing in spaces with other people, maybe not the, the best way to um, protect yourself. So we're looking at all of those things. When you mentioned about in those remote spaces in our elementary, one of the reasons that that was put into that schedule is to have more touch points. The place where parents might struggle most is their K to eight students rather than their high school student. High school students have a little more independence. And we wanted to give more touch points with our students, which is why Unified Arts in elementary was considered on one of those remote days. It doesn't mean though that as moving forward in those project-based groups that they can't have some of that work happen at school as well. Um, so a lot of that is being fleshed out right now with, with more focused groups. So I have two more questions, and, and I guess these should be fairly easy. Um, we have a registration date for our digital academy from July 13th through August 1st. Given the divide, the digital divide that we have in the district right now, there's families without computers, without hotspots. How are we touching base with them so they can, one, test the digital academy and see what it looks like, and then, two, so they can register? And so I'm going to let Dr. Klein respond to the enrollment piece of that. But I think that if Ms. Gillison were here, uh, one of the things that she is working on is an engagement strategy and looking at questions such as that. Um, I, I know that's a family engagement piece that she probably could answer um, well. I do know that we have planned parent academies. My team is leading some of those in terms of the educational space. Um, and they have answered questions. They fielded some of the, the what will this look like yesterday. Um, but I'll let Dr. Klein talk about enrollment itself. Thank you, Dr. Ocasio. Dr. Pierce, to your question, we have a threefold approach that we're looking at. Our communications team, as you know, is extraordinary in marketing and they will actually be working on the marketing plan. The engagement team will be following up with parent academies and touch out based meetings with different community groups. And then our accountability team will actually follow up in doing uh, individual phone calls because not all of our parents are digitally savvy. We can tell who has keyed into parent portal and who has not. And so we'll be concentrating on those families who have not engaged in parent portal. And I, and I think that's what we really have to focus on when we think about our students that did not engage uh, when we had to abruptly end our in-class instruction last year, our students who still might have incompletes, our students who still might be without computers, or our families that only have one computer, for us to set a deadline of July 13th for these families to make a critical decision, um, we have to be mindful of the box that we might be putting some of our families in and so the July rate 13, July 13th is the first date they can actually opt into the CCS virtual academy 
our CCS Digital Academy, and then August 1st is the deadline. We will obviously take students after that, but what we were trying to do is provide Myra Wright and her team with um, the number of students K through 12 that want this option so that we can staff it appropriately. Which, which I understand, thank, thank you so much. So my last question is this, throughout the presentation, and I think Dr. Acasio, this will be geared towards you. You talked about maintaining student cohort. Be mindful that teachers will be switching from classes to go teach these student cohorts. One of the issues is how are we ensuring that the contact that teachers are having isn't putting our students at additional risk? And then the second question is, when we talk about student grouping, you might have one student that is excelling in math, but maybe um, struggling a, li a little bit with their science or their reading. How are we ensuring that all the children in that classroom and I don't want us to track kids, right? But how can we ensure that all the students in the classroom are in the best possible cohort where there's good modeling of a growth mindset, of perseverance through difficult problems and, and enrichment opportunities for them as well? Do you understand what I'm getting at with that question? Yes, I do. <laughs> So Dr. Pierce, this is an awesome question. I wish we had more time to explain what we did with the MTSS framework because it gets at just that, because any class could have those levels in it. Um, now it's going to look differently because we only have nine students in a class, whereas you might have had 25 or whatever it might have been. Um, so with these smaller groups, the ranges look differently as well. So we, we do wanna make sure that we're looking at that also. And one of the things that's really going to be important, we have a decision-making tree that was part of that MTSS framework. And it was built out of research that started with Torgerson and Hayes in the ELA world, that English language arts world. And so what we've done is we've contemporized, it was much more towards 2003, we've not learned more about the science of reading. So we've made it more contemporary. We've worked on this model and um, we're bringing this forward as part of our professional development. How do I look at this? So that when we're looking at targeting interventions or enrichments, we're able to consider these decision points and use those short cycle assessments, use those benchmarks, use those diagnostics that we start off in the beginning of the year so that every RIMP doesn't look the same. We don't have leveled reading as the intervention. We have whatever intervention comes out of that um, the decision-making tree. And we've tailored our programs based on those decision-making points. So if it's a phonological processing issue, we've identified, here's our possible interventions. We've also identified based on data, here's a whole group intervention like we've heard from foundations. Um, we've done the same in math as well. And if you'll recall from our high school course guide, we've developed, and they're not tracks, they're pathways because we don't want to track students. We want to give them opportunities. So if I'm struggling in math, I have the extra opportunity to reach Algebra 1 with some success because I'm getting this level of coursework. And we'll do the same even in this remote setting. Now, it will be some wiggle room. It is new to us in a traditional setting, so it's going to be new to us in this remote setting as well. So but this is our first year of activation and we've developed our professional development based on the mindset of this is activation and giving people grace. We really want to extend that grace to our leadership. We wanna extend it to our teachers because it is new and our grace to our students. Students are not used to these environments either and we wanna give them some grace. Um, we know that kids will come back excited and we, we are sure our teachers will be excited about having them and sometimes in excitement with children, it, it's a little bit more tenuous, but we know that we are expecting to build in these interventions, these opportunities for enrichment and really make instruction engaging. That was something that um, we found even in the spring that we, we really need to have something that's going to be engaging. And we had what we had. It was a very quick fix to what was given to us on a very short time frame. But now we've learned some lessons from it. And we've had many teacher groups come together, many leadership groups. So lots of voices in this list of doing that. So we're excited. Excellent. Thank you so much. Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll be brief. I don't have any specific questions. Um, there have been uh, an awful lot of questions asked. There will be boatloads more. Um, but I do have a, a few brief comments. Uh, and I'll keep them short because we're already into our sixth hour after 10 o'clock. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of the 
hundreds of people that participated in this planning effort. Uh, you've done incredibly good work. Um, you know, you've, you've, you know, it's been very comprehensive uh, and very impressive. And I thank everybody that participated, the teachers, the administrators, the uh, work's been good. Um, the reality is for everybody listening, uh, everybody in the community, parents, students, we're gonna need to be very flexible. Um, everyone will continue to be working very hard and we'll be trying to make the best decisions possible. We're gonna be doing that with an eye to making sure that all of our teachers, all of our staff, all of our students are kept safe and healthy and we focus on education. Um, there's nothing more important than those things. There will be mistakes. There will be oversights. There will be missed opportunities. And you know, there will be change, that's for sure. Uh, get used to the idea. Everybody needs to get used to the idea that we will not know all the answers. We won't know everything we don't now, uh, nor will you. Uh, for our part, uh, we're gonna be honest and straightforward and when we don't know, we'll say so, and we will work to get an answer as soon as possible and to implement that. We will listen and we'll make sure that we hear you, whether those are parents or students or community members or staff, teachers. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna be listening a lot and we'll do our best. Uh, importantly, please, everybody, uh, take a deep breath uh, at least once a day, and be kind and considerate to everyone. Uh, this is not easy for some people who thrive on challenges. Um, you know, this is the ultimate. Um, it, it's amazing how much uh, there is here. And, uh, you know, for people that are used to working with a lot of unknowns, and I happen to be one of those, uh, there's, you know, something rewarding about all of this. But, uh, you know, for those of you, uh, uh, just be patient and, and thank you. Thank you, Board Member Brown, Board Member Raglan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dixon, I'd like to thank you uh, and your team for uh, just excellent work here. Uh, thank you to every member of the task force for the work that you've done over the last several months in getting this information to us. My question, um, for you, Dr. Dixon, is what can this board do to help you and the team immediately? Uh, leaving out of this meeting tonight, going into tomorrow, um, you, you've given us a lot of information, but I haven't heard you task us with anything specific that we should be doing uh, to make sure that, that this, this plan is implemented properly. So does that mean that we need to start making calls to the governor's office to tell uh, him and the Ohio Department of Education, the Ohio Department of Health um, to give us definitive information? Uh, do, do we need to start talking to our community stakeholders uh, about what this plan looks like and, and getting information from them that we can then give back to you uh, that's actionable? What is it that you need from us uh, as as representatives of the community in order to make this go. Thank you, Board Member Ragman. I think one of the first things uh, is to help us engage our, our families and partners um, on how to register, where they can go to get additional help with registering online if you want to online classes, making sure we have you have the information about where they can get a device or hotspots, Anything that they need, if you can help get the word out for other partners to help engage in that. So we don't want families to not know how to navigate because it's, you know, as you stated, we've been working hard. We don't want to miss the opportunity for not engaging people because people didn't know how to engage with us. So, you know, I have seven board members who will be equipped with information and that you can, um, cascade that information out through your channels, um, that would be um, a great benefit to us. And then help answer and um, uh, answer questions 
and then filter those questions back to us. Um, you know, when you hear questions, um, get those to Misty, um, and we will get those to the team, um, direct families to the website, remind them that we will update the website as much as possible. Um, and, and, and as board member um, Brown stated, hey, we don't have all the answers, but we're working hard to get the answers from families. And we know that in many, um, there may be a lot of case by case scenarios, um, and we're going to work on that too. If there were unanswered questions from tonight, we're going to work on those. We're going to look at the Facebook um, comments and making sure we have somebody answering those questions. Scott has a person on the communication team that does that. So um, again, just making sure families understand we are here to listen while we do this work. Um, it won't be perfect because we've never seen these times, these unprecedented times before. But our number one priority is making sure that our students are safe and that we can educate them in a safe environment while also providing rigor and other extracurricular, uh, extracurricular activities if we can. You know, and those ifs uh, are challenging because we want students to have as much as possible uh, some uh, things that they're familiar with. Um, and if we can make those things possible, then by all means that uh, we will. Um, I think a highlight for us is that our students, I don't think would be as challenged as much working in a digital space. This is a space that our students work very well in. Um, and so I think once we uh, students understand what their day will look like, I think they will thrive in the digital space um, well, we will focus on making sure that our team has the equipment that they need, the resources, the professional development, so that we can meet those needs of the students and families. So I think that would be something I would want the board to do immediately. So ask me to, if you need additional information, um, some talking points, those things that the board members may need, we will provide those for you too as you go out um, and, and deliver the message to other stakeholders. Thank you for that. I, I might suggest that after we hear from uh, Governor DeWine on Thursday um, that that the communications team develop maybe a reopening one pager that allows to uh, have all of the links and phone numbers that are necessary, uh, all of the registration opening dates and deadlines all in one place uh, that be, uh, you know, easily uh, transformed over into something that we could share on social media and share with our networks. Uh, but just something that's on, on one page gives us all of the information that we need um, in order for our families to see everything and, and you know, maybe, a, you know, refrigerator magnet type deal uh, that we could get some stuff out to our families relatively quickly, uh, that it could be easily accessible for them. So as they go through this process, They've got it right there at their hands. They know exactly what it is that they can do. And that's something that the board members can uh, easily disseminate, uh, you know, on social media and in person when we do have the opportunity to be around other folks. Thank you. I will. Thank you, board member Beckerly. Um, I just wanted to also um, emphasize and um, express my gratitude to the focus on social emotional learning and wellness and trauma-informed practices and restorative justice practices. I think that um, to your point, Dr. Dixon, this is a pandemic and kids are, you know, to some extent that should be our priority because, you know, kids can't learn unless they're, you know, secure and they're able to work through all of their stresses. And um, in the long run, when this is behind us, that foundation, is going to be critical to the success of our students and you know the the wellness of our buildings as a whole so i really appreciate that that being a focus i hope we can be true to that because i think that's critical in all of this thank you i just want to remind families that the presentation uh from tonight's um meeting is online um, as well as the frequently asked questions, which will be continued to be updated. 
if you have a question that was not answered, I know that there was a lot of things that just because we may not be able to answer or didn't get to, um, all your questions are important. You can email the customer relations uh, email address or the fact line. Um, and we definitely wanna hear from you. So please communicate with us. Um, you know, we, we all have to be in this together. And again, I wanna say thank you to our, our team. They, they had a daunting task of knowing that as soon as they walked out of the room with a recommendation, uh, half of the community would be upset with them. Um, half of the community would say we didn't do enough. Um, half would say we did too much. Um, and so in reality, I think if we can all take a step back and just remember that our kids have to be number one, and we're in a space we've never been in before, uh, and we all need to give each other a little grace. Um, you know, me as a single mom who works a full-time job, who depends on latchkey, um, I'm right there with you. This is, this is tough with, with a fifth grader now. Um, so, you know, we all have to work together and, and, and be there for each other. So more answers are coming. Check the website, check your parent portal. Um, we'll figure out better ways to communicate um, and we will be in this together. Um, so if there's no additional questions, we will move on in our agenda. Okay, so we will move to item seven, the internal auditor. Do you have an executive report this evening? <laughs> Thank you, President Adair. I do not have an executive report tonight. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item eight, uh, Mr. Treasurer, do you have an executive report this evening? No. Thank you. We will move on to item nine, which is our consent agenda. Uh, members may request an item to be removed from the consent agenda. Um, by majority vote. Are there any items that you would like to be considered for removal this evening? Seeing none, we will, uh, is there a motion to approve? I'll move consent? approval of the consent agenda. Second. Oh, great. Um, Mr. Treasurer, or are there any questions or comments? Sorry. Okay, Mr. Treasurer, please call the roll. Mr. Brown? I vote yes on everything except item 25.5. And on that item, I vote no. Mr. Cole? Yes. Dr. Pierce? With the exceptions of item 14.1, 24.5, 24.6, 24.7, 24.8, 24.1 and 24.5, correct? Yes, I'm abstaining from those two, but yes on everything else. Thank you, Do Mr. Ragland. Yes, it's here I'd like to point out that we have zero LEDE participation on this entire agenda. With that, I would vote yes, with the exception of items 18.1, 18.3, 18.4, on which I vote no. If I could, I understand that there is one contract that is LEDE, and that was the uh, insurance uh, uh, adjuster. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Rackland, I have you as yes, except voting no on items 18.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.4. That is correct, sir. Thank you. Vice President Reyes. Yes. President Adair. Yes. Ms. Beckerly. Yes. That motion carried. Thank you. We will now move on to board announcements. Um, I do have an announcement. Um, I want to recognize, and I think we're going to throw a slide up for a second, um, that the Paragon Project it has a new album release event. Um, and they are led by assistant principal, Dr. Tony Anderson out of Fort Hayes. And if you have not 
listened to this amazing music, you really should. Um, and you can tune in to the virtual album release party on July 10th. Um, the Paragon Project Volume 4, Adolescent, uses music to tell a coming of age story of a young adult tackling social issues. The project features original hip hop, R&B, and Afrobeat music written, produced, and arranged by our very own Fort Hayes um, Metropolitan Education Center students. Um, you know, we talk about social emotional, we talk about using art as a therapy. This right here is what we're talking about. So please tune in, please support our students, especially now, um, and you will be amazed. Um, so that was my announcement. Any other announcements from? Board member Raglan. Thank you, Madam President. We talked a little bit earlier about um, athletics and some of the unknowns that are associated with athletics, but uh, I've been hearing from several coaches uh, that have talked about uh, this new paradigm that is really occurring where we have some students that heretofore may not have been eligible uh, to play particularly in football in our upcoming sports season but this year they are eligible because of the opening that has been created due to COVID-19. And it is at this point, I'd like to speak to those young people uh, about this opportunity. Uh, you all have been given a chance to do something that if you take the right opportunity and you take the right approach and the right attitude, this could be life-changing for you. And so you're getting a chance and you've been blessed with this chance to get onto the gridiron and get inside uh, other opportunities for sports that you may be able to use to boost yourself up and academically perform now because of your association with the team. And I don't want to overlook that as we begin our practices on a lot of campuses tomorrow. Please take the bull by the horns, take advantage of this opportunity that you have been given do the work not only on the fields of athletics, but also do the work in the classroom. Life-changing opportunities don't always come and get laid in your lap like this one has. Our coaches are eagerly anticipating your participation in our athletics this year. Our staff is eagerly anticipating your new devotion to your academics because of your opportunity. And I wanna make sure that you know that you have this board support in all of your endeavors. I wish you Godspeed and good health in all of our athletics. And that's just not for those that are new uh, to our athletic fields this year, but for those that are returning as well as our coaches and those volunteers uh, that have given so much of their time for our young people. That is my announcement. Thank you very much, Mr. Adair. Uh, you're welcome. We will go to board member Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Very quickly, um, I just want to shout out uh, our students that finalized their graduation uh, experience this, this week um, and all of the folks who participated in that. Um, again, uh, despite the conditions that uh, precipitated this having to be this way, uh, this graduation 2020 class, um, there were so many folks behind the scenes that worked very diligently to put things together in a way that was really classy, in a way that made this experience for our students a bit above and beyond. I know we've not acknowledged them before, but I definitely just want to give uh, a big shout out to all of those partners that gave the gift boxes and um, put together the events and the videos and all of the work that was done behind the scenes. Um, so thank you so much for that. I also want to shout out uh, churches, our faith community, like Faith Ministries, that was uh, gave a graduation Sunday ceremony um, and acknowledged so many of our youngsters who have graduated from high school this year. So I wish them all the best. Uh, I look forward to next year, and we're going to have a great 2021. And just to jump on that, if we could make the start of this school year just as special for all of our students as a community, um, you know, I think we should. 
our students will react to how the grownups react. So if we are excited and proud of them and support them, they will have a better experience. I agree. We had two donors, by the way, as well, uh, one of whom is a principal of our downtown high school on the agenda giving money. Thank you for them as well. Uh, Vice President Reyes. Thank you, President Adair. So I, I've, I'm along the same lines as uh, Board Member Cole. I wanted to congratulate our our graduates, uh, all the work that went into the virtual graduations, the the boxes, the scholarships. I know I can went out there and was handing out some scholarships. A lot of our community members, um, in addition to uh, what the district did, were also celebrating our kids. So we want to thank them for all the work they're doing. Um, also want to kind of remind our students, there are stu still students that are working for towards graduation for the summer, summer graduation. So we want to encourage you to keep going and keep striving. We're, we, uh, we are going to celebrate you just as much. Uh, please know that just because uh, maybe you needed just a little bit more time, it's okay. We're still here. We're still, we're, we're, we're jogging, running, walking. Uh, and cheering you all alongside, just as we did all the other graduates that just recently went. So, so please keep going, keep keep uh, keep striving for that excellence. And if you need some help, please reach out to uh, our uh, administration, our principals, and we want to see you graduate. And we want we want to see the. A lot of times, people don't see um, our summer graduation when you see the multiple colors. And all our students coming from all of our high schools, it is just a beautiful sight to see. So just keep on going and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pierce. Um, so I too want to um, congratulate our class of 2020. I had the opportunity to watch live a lot of our virtual graduations and I saw the excitement of our students, of community members, of people from all over the country um, tuning in to our celebrations to congratulate our, our class of 2020. I wanna encourage you to show that same grit, perseverance, and resilience as you go out into the world, be it a job, be it college, be it the military. We are in fact in uncertain times and you might have had a dream that may look a little bit different now that you go out into the world, but what you have proven, um, and not just this year, but in all your years as a CCS student, is that you can succeed and you can achieve. So I wish that you all will continue to succeed and achieve to our fifth graders um, who left their elementary schools, to our eighth graders who have left their middle schools and are going into high school, continue again to take that same perseverance, resilience and grits with you as well. Um, I also like to take an opportunity to acknowledge that it's starting to get hot and we are in fact in summer vacation. A summer vacation that's gonna look very different for our students. As a CCS student, I enjoyed the summers because I got to go visit family members, aunties and uncles and cousins, mostly because my mother was a single mother that was working and raising us, but it gave me a great opportunity to be around family and to learn from family. I understand that a lot of our students will not get to do that given the precautions that we are taking for COVID-19. So it's not just an announcement, it's a heartfelt prayer that I send out to all of our students that you have a safe summer, that you have a safe summer. I love you all and I wanna see you all come back next school year. Enjoy your summer. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. One thing that I forgot to mention, um, I always like to um, say the names of the graduates who are receiving the 22 uh, plus adult high school diploma. So I want to say congratulations to Hattie Marie Lemons. And it, it is my understanding that Miss Lemons is almost at her 70th birthday. So it is never, ever too late to get that high school diploma. So congratulations, Miss Lemons, on graduating from high school. I do have to point out that's not really very old. 
You're right. You. It's not Thank at you, all. Harry. Ms. Adair, can I, uh, President Adair, can I say one more thing? Yes. Uh, thank you. So I just wanted to congratulate Noah Perry, who is a graduate of Northland High School, is now a graduate of Wittenberg University with two degrees, a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and a Bachelor of Arts in Theater. That's my nephew, a Northland grad. Um, and I really want to just reiterate, uh, Noah had a very difficult start to his life. He had 13 surgeries, 22 hospitalizations, every step of the way. Uh, he struggled, but uh, uh, he was involved with band. He, did a, he was uh, one of the outstanding students in Northland. And uh, just to see him uh, graduate Winnenberg and uh, two degrees, sociology and theater. So he'll help you with your uh, uh, social emotional, but then he'll also uh, be out there. Maybe we'll catch him on the, on the big screen. So congratulations, Noah. We love you. Thank you. Any more announcements? All right. We will now go back into executive session. We are not done, board members. So Vice President Reyes, you have a motion. Yes, I'm trying to get it up and unmute myself at the same time. I move the Board of Education recess into executive session for section 121.22 G1 of the Ohio Revised Code to consider the appointment, employment, or compensation of a public employee. I second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cole. Yes. Dr. Pierce. Yes. Mr. Ragland. Yes. Vice President Reyes. Yes. President Adair. Yes. Ms. Beckerley. Yes. Mr. Brown. Sure. That motion carried. Thank you. And to the public, we will uh, come back to this public session for adjournment. So we will see you back to close our meeting. Thank you to the staff who are not joining us in executive session for hanging out through this, uh, this meeting. And thank you all for your work. And for those that are taking a break in uh, July, it's well-deserved. And um, I know that there's still a lot of people that are working. So, um, but uh, thank you. So see y'all later. We'll come back. Thank you. I am. Can I move to adjourn? No, because I have to reconvene the meeting. Do this every time. <laughs> So I'm reconvening the meeting, and we are now at the item 28, adjournment. Now, is there a motion to adjourn? Board member Bat Brown, would you like to make the motion? Yes, um, I repeat what I said. I second. Thank you, call the roll. Dr. Pierce. Yes. Mr. Ragland. Yes. Vice, Vice President Reyes. Yes. President Adair. Yes. Ms. Beckerley. Yes. And Mr. Brown. Yes. And Mr. Cole. Yes. Motion carry. We are Thank adjourned. You all. Good night, everyone. Good, night. Good job, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. New. Good evening, uh, CCS community. This is President Adair, and I am calling the June 30th regular uh, business meeting of the Columbus Board of Education to order. Mr. Treasurer, please call the roll. President Adair. Present. Ms. Beckerley. Present. Mr. Brown. I'm here. Mr. Cole. Here. Dr. Pierce. Present. Mr. Ragland. Here. Vice President Reyes. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you so much. We will have the Pledge of Allegiance being delivered tonight by Robert Rausch, um, who is representing Troop 734. Hi. Thank you for being here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Um, board members, we will now review and adopt the agenda. 
Um, we will actually, after this, go into executive session. Uh, upon return, we will have board discussion. There are no public comments this evening. After that, we will have a report from the uh, superintendent. Uh, there is no executive reports expected from the internal auditor or treasurer this evening. We have items on the consent agenda to review and approve. And then we will close with board announcements and then end our meeting with another executive session, coming back to public session for adjournment. Are there any uh, questions? Or, I'm sorry, is there a motion to approve the adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Are there any questions or concerns about the agenda? Seeing none, please call the roll, Mr. Treasurer. President Adair. Yes. Ms. Beckerly? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Cole? Yes. Dr. Pierce? Yes. Mr. Raglan? Yes. Vice President Reyes? Yes. That motion carried. Thank you so much. We will now um, go into executive session and Vice President Reyes has that motion. Uh, thank you, President Adair. I move that the Board of Education recess into executive session for section 121.22. G4 of the Ohio Revised Code. To prepare for, conduct, or review negotiations or bargaining sessions with public employees concerning their compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment and per section 121.22 G1 of the Ohio Revised Code to consider the employment, employment, or compensation of a public employees. Thank you, is there a second? A second. Please call the roll. Ms. Beckerly. Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Cole? Yes. Dr. Pierce? Yes. Mr. Ragland? Yes. Vice President Reyes? Yes. President Adair? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. We will return from executive session at the conclusion of our agenda there. So we will be back public and board members wait to be moved into the breakout room. <laughs> 